In this video, let's take a look at the corporate tax return. That's Form 1120 here for the year 2018, really calendar year 2018. If it's not the calendar year, then you have to f type in or fill in the physical year here at the top. Name of the corporation, address, city, state, zip code, if it's changed from the previous year, you need to check off the boxes here. If this, this is the first return, creating a new corporation, that would be checked off here. Or if this is the final return, which we'll talk about uh, in liquidations in the next couple of chapters, there's a box for that. Off to the left side are other boxes. We had talked about consolidated returns where you combine the parent and subsidiaries net income or loss. Here this is an election using this form 851. Uh, special rules apply to farms and here insurance companies. Personal holding companies we talked about in a previous chapter. Personal service corporations usually like a a medical practice or even an accounting or a uh, legal practice, their profit is taxed at a usually a higher rate in past years it was it was 35 percent. Um, for 2018 now it's the same flat rate as a regular corporation so I'm not sure the significance now of a personal service corporation unless there are some limitations between the deductibility of when the uh, officers or the employees who own the company get paid when they can deduct the um, or accrue the cost on the corporate return. This first section for income pretty much the same as a Schedule C that we had seen um, back in our first chapter except maybe if you take a look at line 8 here it says capital gains, net capital gains being added in, but you don't see capital losses being deducted because we learned here in Chapter 5, net capital losses cannot be deducted to offset the other income of the corporation. You get to carry forward that capital loss, really carried back for the past three years and then carried forward for the past f next five years. We had talked about re depreciation recapture ordinary income here. Um, I guess it was two chapters ago, and a miscellaneous income figure here. Okay, going further down the form, the deductions. Let's take a look at some of them that were mentioned here in Chapter Five that can be different than on a corporation's income statement we had maybe compensation to highly paid officers in the case of those being paid over a million dollars possibly any excess is non-deductible bad debt expense remember for tax purposes you have to use the direct write-off method versus possibly the allowance method that's utilized on the financial statements something a little um, I mentioned maybe earlier was the calculation of the state income taxes being deducted here on the federal return. So pretty much you need to finish the state tax return first to complete your federal tax return. You need to possibly accrue that state income tax and deduct it on the state income tax return and whatever tax you have on the state tax return you're going to deduct it over here on the federal return. We saw interest deductions being limited here for 2018, um, possibly 30% of the taxable income figure kind of down here. The pre, uh, charitable contributions, we know there's a 10% limitation of the taxable income, so any excess um, is carried forward for the next five years like capital losses. Depreciation, we saw that a couple of chapters ago calculated and reported on form 4562 and because of the large section 179 and bonus depreciations what's being deducted here on the tax return is probably bigger than the amount maybe straight line on the income statement 
So that was a timing difference, a book to tax difference. Um, there could be, uh, we saw differences in the case of employee stock option plans. Okay, so we subtotal the deductions and subtract it from the income to get a tentative taxable income. You still have to deduct here in line 29 net operating losses that we had mentioned in uh, this chapter 5. And here it's a special deduction on Schedule C that includes that last difference that um, dividend received deduction in the previous slideshow. To get to eventually the true taxable income that we multiply by 21%, here it's done on a Schedule J, and subtracting out any taxes we paid and credits to either get an amount owing yet, and if it's big and you didn't meet that estimated tax requirement we had talked about in the last video, you may also owe a penalty. And uh, any overpayment, you can either have it refunded or credited to next year's estimated tax payments. Let's take a look at uh, page two. There's uh, six pages to this 1120 form. Here uh, at the top of uh, most of page two is a Schedule C that deals with the dividend received deduction. So you're putting in the dividend here in the column A and you're multiplying it by a rate here in column B. We learned about the 50% rate if the uh, investing corporation owns less than 20% of the investee corporation or a 65% dividend received deduction rate if you own 20% or more about uh, less than 80% and then if you own 80% I believe that's an affiliated an affiliated corporation here a hundred percent assuming that you're not filing a consolidated return uh, with those other affiliated corporations so you total up your dividend income here at the bottom of these these columns, column A. Looks like it takes up the whole page. So this should match up with the income back on page one. And you total up your deductions here, dividend received deduction. And a lot of the lines here deals with foreign income, uh, foreign investments, foreign investors. And we'll see that throughout the whole 1120 form. Um, it's kind of a, a, a place where people abuse, um, evade the taxes, U.S. taxes, by having control or ownership indirectly hidden through foreign ownership, foreign corporations. Anyway, this total here is deducted back, I believe, on line 29 on, on page 1. Let's go on to uh, page 3. So there's probably some questions here that needs to be answered. Well, the tax calculation is real simple. Basically, it's going to be 21% of your taxable income coming back on um, page one. So there may be some other taxes, credits. Um, the credit we had mentioned at the very end of the last video, I believe uh, the alternate minimum tax credit is reported uh, first on another form. Maybe it's this one right here and offsetting the tax to a certain limit. I believe it was 50%. And payments. So if you remember um, the last thing we had calculated or the second to the last thing we calculated in the previous video lecture was estimating the, the payments that should be made by those four quarters. So just adding them all up and then the total here in line 14. If you're going to file an extension, you still may have to make a payment, and that would be reported on a Form 7004. Okay, so all of these totals would then go back to page one, offsetting the tax. Let's take a look at the next page, page four. So questions. Here's something that we had learned about back in chapter one, methods of accounting. 
and again a lot of the questions deal with foreign investors or just investors uh, in general and in fact whether our corporation is investing in other businesses and they want to see if there's any type of uh, relationship and inter um, taxpayer type of transactions okay so you're disclosing all of that there's really no calculation here okay so a lot of questions answered with fill in the blank or check boxes here's another page worth of questions basically yes no answers and then on our uh, last page something most of our accounting majors are familiar with this is your financial statement balance sheet even though you have an ink uh, tax return on page one you're not asked to prepare or submit an income statement but this balance sheet is based upon your financial statements it's not really based upon your tax return. So the beginning of the year balance sheet is really what you had at the end of last year. And here is the end of the current year, broken down by assets. And of course, we know the accounting equation are equal to the liabilities, all of it here, well, up to here, and then the equity of the corporation. Um, there's four columns here. Yeah, it's really the first and the third column are are pairing. Like here's the accounts receivable and the allowance. Keeping in mind the allowance method is not utilized for tax return back on the page one, right? Again, this which is balance sheet is based upon financial statement gap rules. Here's the cost of your depreciable assets, and here's the accumulated depreciation equal to the book value. So basically, this first column A and column B is just grouping, right? And then subtotal, grouping and subtotal. You're adding up all your assets, adding up all your assets. And of course, we know the assets are equal to liabilities plus equities asset equal to liabilities plus equity. What we had discussed in that previous video was the Schedule M1. Or possibly you need to do a Schedule M3. Here the Schedule M3. If the company's assets were more than $10, $10 million dollars if you're a smaller corporation then you're lucky you just get to do this schedule M1 well, we kinda talked about it the starting point is the net income here on your financial statement and working your way down and across to this number here which if you minus out that net operating loss amounts being carried over to this year and you minus out the dividend received deduction the remainder should be the taxable income back on page one of this 1120 form so all of the blanks here in between the net income and the taxable income are those book to tax differences the ones on the uh, left side here are going to be added to the net income making the taxable income bigger. The ones here on the right side are going to be subtracted from the net income to make the taxable income bigger. Also we had identified whether these differences were temporary or permanent and though that will come more into play when we uh, do chapter 6 our next chapter. Okay, the next schedule at the very, very end of this 1120 form is another Schedule M here, M2, where if we go back to the balance sheet, if you remember uh, retained earnings in your um, financial accounting class, you had to prepare an income statement, a balance sheet that we're looking at here, a cash flow statement, and probably a statement of retained earnings 
or statement of stockholders equity. Well basically this Schedule M is figuring out how you got from here the retained earnings at the beginning of the year to the retained earnings at the end of the year. Beginning of the year retained earnings end of the year retain earnings and we know when we do closing entries the revenue and the expenses get closed out into retain earnings or in other words the net income the income summary gets closed out be it positive net income or negative net loss also dividends get closed out into retain earnings definitely being minus out here and there could be some other adjustments to retain earnings to get to the ending and again these figures have to match up with what you see above in the balance sheet um, again uh, I won't go into any detail here for the schedule M3 but again it's a bigger version of the schedule M1 and a lot of it again has to deal with foreign um, income foreign expenses foreign investors okay and then another form really not not a form but a worksheet that you don't really turn in with your tax return but just keep it for your own records is the same calculation we had done in the previous uh, video regarding estimated taxes if you remember we were calculating the four quarterly payments based either upon the prior year tax liability or the actual tax liability for this year or an annualized uh, amount by quarter for this year and so that's all calculated pretty much uh, I guess using a longer format than the, than the slideshow than our textbook here on this form 1120 um, W for worksheet okay that's it for chapter 5 make sure you do the um, learn smart practice problems your homework and you study again before taking that chapter quiz okay talk to you later